Anyone who had read isekai novels would have imagined this. She wondered what she would do if it were her. Would she choose a black panther like the rabbit? This lovely manhua is titled, I Became a Tyrant's Maid. If you love stories like this, please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you'll never miss the next episode. She pondered whether a symbolic relationship would be beneficial to enjoy a happy life with her adorable daughter. Despite being a mother, she couldn't deny her daughter's overwhelming cuteness. Alternatively, should she enter a contract marriage with the male lead to protect her family? She reasoned that it would secure her position as head of the household. Shifting her contemplation, she considered whether she could settle for a survival scenario. In short, she concluded that survival in such scenarios was beyond her capabilities. In summary, she was done for. What on earth was going through this lady's mind? As she lay on the floor, finally awakening after a long time, her first thought was that she didn't want to go to work. She also wondered whether she was still dreaming. As her eyes blinked wider, she saw a figure right before her. She questioned whether a hotel had appeared in any of her dreams, and if so, it was an occupational hazard. Was the person who was now using his teeth to drag off his gloves, revealing his bloody hands, a foreigner? She wondered whether she had fallen asleep after watching a foreign drama last night. The figure had already removed his glove and taken his seat, instructing her to wipe off his hands. As she sat up, still wondering what was going on, upon hearing his request, she exclaimed, Huh? Noting that there was blood on his hands, it seemed like she had come back to reality. She brought in a bowl filled with clean water and a towel and began cleaning his hands. Inwardly cursing that she should have listened to her mother and chosen an easier job, she regretted her career path. She also cursed at the stench of blood. Just seeing this, she thought she would rather not have a job than work for a person like this. Taking his palm into her hands to further clean it with the cloth, she got caught up staring at the scar on his palm, causing him to question whether she was going to clean it or not. By the way, did I mention that he was so handsome? He was exactly her type. As if she had been holding his hands for too long, he aggressively asked her to release his hands, causing her to reconsider whether he was her type after all. When she finished cleaning his hands, she stood up and positioned herself in front of him. This prompted him to order her to leave, stating that she was done with her activities. She turned around and headed for the door. Truth be told, no matter how good looking he was, if his personality was awful, then he was out of consideration. Out. As she stepped outside, she encountered a small crowd of maids and butlers. They were noisy and all gasped in shock with their mouths agape. They called her name and she wondered if they were calling for her, all astonished that she had emerged alive. A maid approached her, holding her hands in worry, questioning whether she was okay and how she... In Rose's mind, she still felt like she was lucid dreaming, amazed that she could also feel sensations. The next minute, a tray of champagne glasses fell to the floor, making a loud, shattering noise. The butler's mouth widened to the fullest as he saw Rose, questioning whether she was still alive. Rose wondered why everyone was being so dramatic. But moments later, she began to wobble and lose her senses, falling to the ground. Weren't they Korean? She wondered. Her head throbbed as she exclaimed, Ugh! Seeming to recall the accident she had in what looked like her past life, she remembered, She is Rose, the daughter of Baron Estania. After her parents passed away, she worked as a maid at the Crown Prince's palace. Still in shock, just yesterday she had become the Crown Prince's chambermaid. Memories of her new body flooded her mind, causing her to tremble on the floor. When she woke up, she got up and headed straight for a mirror in utter disbelief. She wondered who the person she was looking at was and what was with the unrealistic pink hair. She grabbed it in shock, also taking in the lace nightgown she was wearing now, something she would never normally wear. She couldn't believe her eyes. It was something unbelievable. She ran around the room, flinging out things from the wardrobe as if searching for something. She was looking for proof, anything at all to prove that she wasn't crazy. Totally restless, she swung her head from front to back and caught a glimpse of a book lying on the table. The book seemed ominous, she trembled at the sight of it. But to her, it also seemed like a clue, so she really had no other choice. Wondering if something would happen if she touched it. She inched closer and closer to the book, only a few stretches away. Just as she touched the book, a glowing light appeared around her, blinding her eyes and illuminating the entire place. She cringed at how bizarre the light effect was. When the book finally stopped glowing and opened, she saw that it was a journal entry, a diary. The heading recorded her duties as the crown prince's chambermaid. 
She squinted her eyes, trying to read what was written down. It said to wake up at 6 a.m. because the Crown Prince's breakfast was at 7 a.m. She was to receive the meal from the kitchen and take it straight to the Crown Prince's chamber. After the meal, she was to assist the Crown Prince with his outings. As she flipped through the pages, she wondered why there wasn't something more significant than what she was reading. When she finally saw what terrified her beyond belief, it said that she was to kill the Crown Prince. She gasped in shock, wondering what on earth was going on. Emily, the previous chambermaid, was dead, and now it was her turn next. She was just a maid. She reasoned how she was supposed to kill the Crown Prince. It was basically telling her to die. She reasoned further because it was strange to her. People don't usually write that sort of thing in a diary. It was as if it was written to be revealed. As she flipped the pages again, another shock came about. She saw what was written. The Duke only wanted to kill Calix Forsman. Recalling his bloody hands, the book dropped from her hands as she was in total shock. She uttered the name again, Calix Forsman. That Calix Forsman? She was in disbelief, finally understanding that she had reincarnated into another world. She slapped her cheeks in shock, screaming no, and wondering what had happened to her career, her family, her life. She took a deep breath, trying to understand the situation and come to terms with reality. She bent down and picked the book up. It was really unsettling. She was slowly recovering the memories of the body she now inhabited. She was Rose Estania, the orphaned young lady of the ruined Baron family, appointed as the chambermaid of Prince Calix Forsman. Realizing that it was the wicked novel she had read last, and Calix Forsman was the tyrant male lead of the novel. It wasn't just any normal wicked novel, it is a 19 plus adult wicked romance fantasy published in the early 2000s. Ha 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 ha! This should be fun! She was now in over her head, panicking and wondering why she had read such a book. There were literally many other novels, such as Reverse Harem, Romantic Comedies, or even the one where it turns out that she would be an emperor's daughter. She now realized, as if recalling something, wondering if there was actually a character named Rose in the novel. If the male lead who appears as a tyrant is still the crown prince, it simply means that this was the prequel to the novel's event, which further means that she was now possessed as an extra, and she could die at any time. The Calix Forsman she knew from the novel was someone who would cut her throat if she simply annoyed him. It was driving her crazy. She wondered what on earth this cotton candy-like female lead style was. The heart was totally awful. Finally coming to a realization, she wondered whether she was really dead. She hoped not because she had just gotten into the hotel. She knew what she had to do, and that was to survive where she was first and foremost. She knew that Calix would soon kill all his siblings and ascend the throne, so it was obvious whose side she should be on. As the book lay smoothly on the bed, she looked at it again, stretching her hands towards it, and then she opened it up. Reading the duties again, breakfast was at 7 a.m. Her thoughts were that the body she inhabited sure woke up really early, just like a workaholic. Rose then got dressed in her maid outfit, tying her hair up and memorizing the routine in just 10 minutes. She was now ready for battle. Without ever offending the male lead, she was determined to be on the winning team, survive safely, and return back home. So her mission was clear now. Operation Come Back Home. I really doubt things will go according to plan, but anyways, let's see. She had now reached the kitchen, seeing the workers there. She greeted them with a hello and commended them for working hard. They just stared at her and asked her what brought her there. She stepped into the kitchen, telling them that she was there to bring the Crown Prince's breakfast. The chef started stroking his fingers on his beard, saying that he heard a little maid had become the Crown Prince's chambermaid, scrutinizing and analyzing her from head to toe. He finally made a snarky comment, laughing and saying that he was surprised she still had her head attached. Knowing fully well what he was hinting at, Rose awkwardly replied, Oh, of course, wondering how she could talk without her head on. Getting straight to business, she asked what was in the Crown Prince's breakfast menu today, making the chef question warily why she wanted to know that. Rose then looked around, wondering what was going on in the kitchen, as it was so filthy. It wasn't in the novel at all. Bringing her back to the question, he asked again why she was asking. Rose just scratched her head nervously, explaining that she lacked etiquette and that the food was for the Crown Prince. So as the chambermaid, she should at least know the menu, ending her words with an awkward laugh. 
The chef thought for a second but still stared, emphasizing that she was just a maid. Rose tried to reason with him so that he would just tell her because if he didn't like the food, it was her neck that would fly. After some persuasion, he finally agreed and showed her the food, a croissant made with butter from the Marilton region and raspberry jam, an omelet with cheese, a salad with arugula and pink pepper sauce, and finally, juice made from garnish apples. The chef then questioned whether she could actually memorize it with a smirk on his face. It was clear that he was openly looking down on her. Rose simply thanked him and told him that she would take it up to him now. As she started walking through the halls with his food, she made a mental note that things had started now. No matter what, under any circumstances, she would make sure not to offend the male lead, or so she thought. It was a crisis right from the beginning. She stopped in shock and panic as she contemplated what she would call calyx. After that brief storm, she calmed herself down and stretched her hand to knock on the door. She had picked the name to call him, stating that it translated to another world's language so he should be able to understand it. This should be good, she thought as she opened the door, just about to utter your highness. What she saw next was unbelievable to her. The crown prince was incredibly handsome, completely erasing the image she had in her head just moments ago. She greeted the crown prince, then he told her to come in. She strolled in with the card in front of her as the crown prince just glared at her without saying a word. He finally let out an evil smirk, pointing at the clock, telling her that if she had been one minute later, he would have cut her neck. Too bad, he said. Honestly, that smirk was really evil looking. In the original novel, Empire of the Blood Moon, Calix's past was not detailed. The most important thing is that Calix is a crazy tyrant who is in love with the female lead because it wasn't about Calix's ambition to become emperor. Hearing what she had just said now, she really didn't expect him to be that crazy. Her eyes were trembling as she fought to stay stable. She started making a chant in her head not to lose because if she lost, she would die. Rose then gave him a wide Korean employee smile, stating that she would make sure to always serve him at this time from now on. Calix just glared at her and removed his face. Carting his dish to him now, Rose smiled as what she had done had worked. She silently wondered. When she was done placing the dishes down in front of him, she stood awaiting any further instructions or comments. As she waited, she started looking around, realizing that this room was a bit strange. She noted that it was too plain to be a crown prince's room, the meal was too plain to be from a royal palace, and the only person serving was her. As if coming to the real fact, she exclaimed inwardly, it seems that he was being ostracized? If this is true, that would explain why he would kill his father and siblings, I guess, but something tells me nothing of how he is right now is his fault. Rose quickly brushed off the thought, saying it was none of her business. Moving in to present the breakfast to him, she cleared her throat, about to start mentioning the things the chef had listed. When she was done, she looked at Calix, now realizing that he had been glaring at her. He began to get up from his chair, making Rose extremely scared and wary, wondering why he was getting up from his chair and also whether there was something he didn't like. He closed in on her, making her back hit the wall. She watched her tremble as he spoke, saying that this was again. He lifted his hand and placed it just beside her head. One could tell that Rose's insides wanted to jump out. What trick is this? He asked. To her, the position they were in was just like a snake wrapping up its food. He smirked at her and she also gave him a slight trembling smile, but she made sure not to reveal the trembling part. She stuttered as she asked, what trick, your highness, or have you changed strategy? He also asked with an evil smile. Rose smiled at him and told him that if he wasn't happy with the menu, she would immediately inform the chef to bring in a new one. She wondered what strategy he was talking about. If he didn't like the menu, he could have just said it. He finally shifted back and resumed glaring at her as he asked, who are you? She honestly wanted to ask him the same thing, calling him a punk. She still had the courage to even inwardly curse him. I must say she mentally prepared herself for this encounter. Go, girl! She introduced herself to him, saying that she was Rose, who had been assigned as His Highness's chambermaid since yesterday. He retorted, asking her whether he asked her that. Still inwardly cursing at him in anger, he screamed at her to answer properly. Rose still offered him a smile, telling him that if there was anything unsatisfactory, she would correct it immediately. But who was she, she wondered. She was an intern hotelier in a five-star hotel in 21 St. Century, South Korea, used to dealing with troublesome customers. She further stated that she won't be defeated just with this. 
He glared at her once more, finally accepting for her to take it away. Rose sighed after the long battle and was happy that what she did had worked. She bowed her head and told him that she would inform the chef to correct it immediately. He just waved his hand for her to leave. As he took a few steps further, he noticed something. That's when Rose spoke, holding the clothes she had spotted before, saying that if he wasn't going to wear it today, she would bring it back after mending it. Finally running off to take her leave, Calix just stared at the now empty space, wondering what had just happened. In the cafeteria bustling with maids, Rose sat down to enjoy her soup when someone called her name. In the next moment, another maid rushed over to her, shaking her while calling out her name. Rose was surprised. She looked at the maid, recognizing her as Mila, and asked how she was. Mila, known for her emotional nature, continued to grab Rose, shaking her and bombarding her with questions about her well-being, knowing that Rose was now the crown prince's chambermaid. Mila started ranting, criticizing the head maid for assigning Rose to the crown prince. She exclaimed, trying to understand why Rose had been chosen. Mila continued with her brutal honesty, mentioning that Rose was perhaps the worst worker in the crown prince's palace, Rose felt awkward at Mila's criticism. Mila quickly clarified, saying she didn't mean it in a bad way. Rose wondered what other way Mila could possibly mean it. Mila then explained that she had the least experience and often made mistakes. Rose questioned why she was assigned to the position if what Mila said was true. Mila then asked if Rose remembered when she broke that expensive dish last time, which had put her on the headmaid's bad side. Now that Mila had mentioned it, the memory flooded back to Rose. Mila interrupted her reminiscing by confessing that she was glad. She stated that once a maid became the crown prince's chambermaid, they said one could never come back alive. Calix, who was always meticulous about every service a maid should provide, had instructed her on the duties, plain rooms for a crown prince, simple clothes, and the order to kill the crown prince. Rose reasoned that if her hypothesis was correct, she would die today. Snapping out of her thoughts for a second, she called Mila to ask her a question. She then asked whether there was a rumor about a new maid coming in. Mila replied joyfully, questioning how she knew. She said that in the morning she had seen the headmaid coming into the palace with a woman. Rose's face had now turned expressionless as she got up from her chair. Mila wondered what had happened and questioned Rose, stating that her face looked bad. Beads of sweat formed on Rose's face as she gritted her teeth, continuing with her paused thoughts, saying that if her hypothesis was right, she would die today. Her hypothesis was that the crown prince, the male lead, was not a ruthless murderer. If the chambermaid who died at his hands had also received the order to kill the crown prince, it would explain why he executed them. The previous chambermaid must have been one of two things either an assassin sent to kill the crown prince or a sacrificial pawn to hold the position until a real assassin could take over. Realizing that the incompetent Rose Estania was likely a sacrificial pawn threatened by the Duke, she judged by the diary's contents that Rose probably wasn't an assassin. For this to be possible, the headmaid must also be aligned with the Duke. The headmaid had the authority to appoint chambermaids and the maid who entered earlier with the headmaid is likely the real assassin. To make room for the new assassin, or to silence her, there was no reason to keep Rose alive. Mila tapped her back, continuously questioning whether she was okay, prompting Rose to reply, Not okay! She wondered why, of all things, she had to get involved in this kind of novel. Gra now lying on her bed, she exclaimed and pondered whether it was necessary to clean such a huge bedroom alone, but she did it because she was a perfect intern hotelier. Snap back to reality, missy! You're a chambermaid whose life is on the line right now, she thought. She accepted the work because it was the only thing to be done. The rest of her time was free. She smiled slightly as she sat up in her bed, staring at the diary beside her. She opened the book with the intent to make a plan. The next thing she saw in the book made her scream, alerting the other maids who were passing by and working nearby. Shocked to the core, she wondered how it was possible. Tell me, tell me, I'm curious, really, really curious. The diary contents had changed. In this paragraph, it stated that the Duke had given her poison to assassinate the crown prince, and it was hidden in a box under the bed on the right side. She read it intently, disbelieving that it was actually where the book said it would be. She got up from the bed and bent down to check. That's when she saw the box. It was really there. Holding it in her hands, she analyzed it, wondering what it was, 
and what they were trying to do to her. She turned immediately to the book, picked up a quill, and wrote the words, What are you? on an empty page in the book, but nothing happened. It was silent throughout. She wondered why that moment wasn't the part where the book should answer, but still nothing happened. After a moment, she dropped the quill on the book, giving up and sighing, stating that it would be scary if it actually answered. Just then, she glanced at the bottle beside her, picking it up along with the poisoned bottle. An evil thought had come to her mind. She questioned why she shouldn't use what had been handed to her properly, letting out an evil cackle. Just as Calix entered his room, what he saw surprised him. His room was sparkling clean. Turning towards the table, he caught sight of the cloth Rose had taken to mend and headed for it. As he reached the table, he picked up the cloth and inspected it. It was clean and well ironed. That was when Rose entered through the door and asked whether she could prepare some tea for him. Calix turned back, glaring at her. In Rose's mind, she knew she had done a perfect job this time, so she smiled inwardly, eager to see where he would find fault. Calix simply told her she was insisting a lot and that she should do as she wished. This made her really vexed. She had worked hard and cleaned the room, and yet he couldn't even utter a simple compliment. Calling him a stingy, petty, stupid bastard, she made sarcastic remarks, suggesting he should enjoy eating and living well alone. Just then, Calix turned around and called out, Hey, you! Rose froze in place, not scared, but wondering if he had hurt her, hoping he didn't have any mind-reading superpowers. She apologized, her fear evident. Calix remarked. He then asked why, and just then, there was a knock at the door, announcing Royal, asking if he could come in. Rose held her chest, heaving a sigh of relief, thanking God that someone's presence had saved her. She realized she knew the name, Royal, the secondary male lead. Meanwhile, somewhere in the palace, Mila had baked a pie for Rose, knowing she had been stressed lately. As Royal entered, Calix sat down at his table and Royal stood opposite him while Rose poured out the tea for them. One could tell she was nervous, as beads of sweat had already formed on her face. As she poured the tea, she wondered whether the tea leaves were safe and debated whether to drink it first to check. She trembled knowing that if it was poisoned, she would die. Unlike the male lead who wouldn't perish as an extra, she would definitely succumb to poison. Picturing what might be engraved on her tombstone, here rests Rose Estania. She died from poison. She chuckled at herself for thinking that far ahead. By the way, she turned her gaze toward Royal. Royal Chris, she thought, the male lead's right-hand man and the leader of the knights. He is a secondary male lead with a kind impression that contrasts with Calix, but in the end he also betrays the male lead, Calix, by having an affair with the female lead. In other words, the guy wasn't normal either, so she didn't want to get involved with him in any way. Royal spoke to Calix, informing him that he had brought the information he had commanded and that he had identified all the relevant people. Calix acknowledged what he had said and asked about the plan. First of all, Royal began, according to their recent activities, this document is presumed to be related to the third prince. The third prince? Rose wondered. The emperor had four children in line for the throne. The first prince, son of the first concubine. The second prince, son of the second concubine. The third prince, also the son of the first concubine, and the fourth prince, the legitimate son of the empress. Calix would eventually eliminate the other princes and ascend the throne. It was far off in the future, but she wondered whether the third prince was the first target. Rose needed to close the distance and stepped forward to place the tea on the table in front of Calix. As Royal had said, the next plan is... Calix continued to glare at her, now calling her. She answered, wondering why he kept calling her. The next thing he said was that she needed to run an errand. Rose left immediately. It was already dark, and she moved through the halls with a torchlight in hand, thinking that things were just getting interesting. Calix had instructed her that at the end of the hallway she was to retrieve Volume 3 of the Empire's history from the dark room. She wondered whether he sent her on the errand to get rid of her. It was also fortunate that he wasn't suspicious, but from Calix's perspective he couldn't trust her. Discussing politics would be uncomfortable, she reasoned. Finally seeing the end of the hallway, she reached for the door handle and opened it. As she entered, it was so dark that it felt like she was in a horror movie. She wanted to find the book quickly and head back. She set the light down and began her search for the book as she grazed through the shelf. 
Finally seeing it, she sighed happily and grabbed it, preparing to head back. That's when a huge wind blew into the room, putting out the light. The fact that she hasn't zoomed out of there immediately baffles me, like what are you still doing there? Even with the light, it was still very dark and now the weird wind came ahead to put the light off. Nay, it can't be me. Rose immediately turned around in fear, calling your highness to see if it was him. She then reasoned that it couldn't be him because the male lead wouldn't do something as pointless as this. Now wondering if it wasn't the male lead, then maybe it was the secondary male lead, or were they one of the traitors? In her mind, she had already come to terms with the fact that she was going to die today. She reasoned that if they were to kill her, they would make it look like an accident and not a murder. She gripped the book harder, stating that if they were investigated, they would get caught, from the assassin to the headmaid and up to the duke, so they wouldn't give any unnecessary hints. In that case, she looked at the window, noting that they were there and planning to push her from it. She was trembling now. Meanwhile, in Calix's room, they were still having their discussion. Calix, whose head was now leaning on his hands, asked whether Royal had looked into the others and where they came from. Stretching out his hand to pass some documents to Calix, Royal said that the new maid seemed to be a mercenary and he had confirmed her ties with the Duke. Calix picked up the documents, went through them, and asked, So it means that Rosa Stania had nothing to do with this? Royal simply replied that it was still unknown. Realizing this, Royal immediately told Calix that he had remembered the maid's name. Calix immediately refuted, claiming he always remembers. Royal argued back, saying it was a lie that Calix always used to say this woman or that woman. Royal smiled, noting that he really liked it this time. Calix touched the cloth that she had mended, remarking that he just couldn't figure out what she was thinking. Royal, who seemed confused, called Calix out, but Calix brushed it off as nothing. He then stated more importantly that it was getting too late, indicating that Rose had taken a long time over there. The next moment, Calix got up and headed for the dark room, prompting Royal to chase after him, saying he would go instead. Calix refuted, saying there was no need and that it was vexing that she was late in fulfilling the Crown Prince's command. Calix reasoned that if Rose wasn't connected to the Duke, then the Duke would try to get rid of her somehow, conveniently, now that she was alone. I can't argue that Calix was really smart to have thought about that, Royal mused inwardly, while Calix cursed and told Royal to hurry up. Just as Calix opened the door, he heard shouts. He fixed his eyes on what was going on just to see Rose screaming for someone to answer her, repeatedly calling the person a despicable, shameless bastard, making both Calix and Royal widen their eyes in shock. Let's go back a little and find out what had transpired. As Rose had noted that the assassin was likely in the room, she started reasoning about where he would attack her from. She held a bottle in her hand, gripping it with fear. The next moment, a hand emerged from the shadows and tried to grab her. In haste, she turned and sprayed the guy with the perfume bottle, which seemed to contain the poison she had put inside. The assassin shrieked, covering his eyes with both hands. He then got angry, swinging his sword at her as she dodged back hurriedly. How dare she, he screamed, continuing to swing. She used the book to block herself, exclaiming, My goodness! She panicked because the book His Highness had asked her to bring was now torn in two. Rose thought to herself, realizing she wasn't even panicking about the assassin, but rather about the torn book. Meanwhile, the assassin had ceased swinging his sword recklessly. He bent over, holding his eyes in pain, asking what it was that she had sprayed him with. Rose screamed, demanding to know who he was. The assassin swung his sword again, calling her a bitch and claiming she had no clue. Rose dodged, but was shocked to realize he still intended to attack her. She shifted back smoothly, grabbing a plant vase behind her. She told him it seemed he didn't realize that what she sprayed on him was poison, smirking as she spoke. What? the assassin exclaimed. She continued, explaining it was poison given to her by the Duke. If he kept moving, the poison would spread and he would soon die. The assassin exclaimed in frustration and told her to stop talking nonsense. Seizing the opportunity presented by his confusion, Rose moved closer and smashed the vase on his head. She was raging inwardly, wondering why he kept cursing and swearing. The assassin now lay finished on the ground, moaning in pain. Rose smiled to herself, saying that even though she was an untrained servant, she wouldn't lose to a blind person. After the adrenaline wore off, it finally dawned on her that her heart felt like it was going to explode. She thought she was going to die. Oh, this girl is something, she chuckled to herself. Rose reached to the floor, grabbed the sword, and started poking the man, demanding to know who sent him. 
She seemed possessed, entering into a fit of rage. She kicked, stomped, and screamed at him uncontrollably, demanding answers. When she finally caught a glimpse of Calix and Royal by the door, she stopped in shock as their eyes met. The assassin stretched his hands out, begging for help. The next moment, her eyes sparkled as she called His Highness coquettishly. Calix covered his now smiling face. Rose was confused about the reason why he was smiling. She then said she was questioning him to know who he was and who sent him. As Calix smiled at her and stepped forward to close the distance between them, Rose told him that she thought he was sent by the Duke. In her mind, she was confused as to why Calix was laughing. She wanted him to stop. She said that when a crazy person laughed, it meant that trouble was brewing. She then brought out the bottle, showing it to him while she said that this was the poison she was keeping and she had sprayed it on the assassin. He took it from her hand, analyzed it, and finally said it was Rexa poison. She wondered how he recognized it just by looking at it. Calix then said that usually within an hour, he would vomit and die. Royal bent down and looked at the assassin, realizing he knew the person. It was the stable guard. By that time, Calix had turned around, heading for the door, and told Royal to take care of the assassin. Royal acknowledged his words. Calix turned to face Rose and told her with a glare to follow him. Rose panicked, wondering why. They were now in the room. Calix took his seat and Rose stood before him in the tense atmosphere. Calix then spoke, saying he needed to get a proper answer from her this time. Beads of sweat started forming on Rose's face as she trembled slightly. Calix now looked terrifying as he said he would ask her directly. The next question he uttered was, What are you? She found it amusing that he asked what instead of who. She wondered what he meant. Did he want her to say she was Lee Che Rin, who used to work in a hotel in Korea? Of course she couldn't. She was Rose Astania, but she knew he wasn't asking that because he already knew. He glared at her. Finally, she started speaking, saying that before she was appointed as a servant to His Royal Highness, she received instructions from His Excellency, the Duke. She explained that she had received the poison at that time, but Calix reasoned why she still had the poison now. She said that if one had a brain, they would know who they should kneel to. She knew what she had to do. The next second, her knees hit the floor as she called His Highness and told him that she would help him with all her heart. It would be more beneficial to be on the same side as him, not the other way around. Calix smirked a little as he sat up on his seat, leaning towards her. He then asked her how she felt about doing it. The next thing Rose said was about food. Calix was confused. She continued, explaining that when she went to the kitchen, she saw many things that needed improvement. Despite serving food to His Highness, the kitchen lacked important items. She also added that she could clean and manage clothes, etc., saying she thought she could provide him with a pleasant environment. Calix spoke, telling her that if she didn't know, he was a descendant of a traitor. Traitor, she wondered? She then recalled an incident where the Empress was accused of being a traitor. Calix continued, saying that she wouldn't benefit from staying with him, questioning whether she realized that. Rose, in her own realization, felt that he still couldn't believe her, stating that he was overly suspicious. She then said she just wanted to live as his maid in the palace. She reasoned that maybe she should have died today, or if not today, then tomorrow, or even the day after tomorrow. So she knew what she had to do, convince him that she was totally submissive. She hit her head on the ground in an attempt to show him how submissive she could be. Inwardly, Rose exclaimed that she had to lose her dignity to save her life. She started saying that she was a complete ally to him, completely loyal, like a faithful dog. Calix was shocked at first by her words, but it immediately changed into a smile. He then told her that if she was begging him like that, they would try at once. Rose raised her now bleeding head and gave him a joyful smile, thanking him continuously and saying that she would serve him faithfully. Calix now got a look at her forehead and how it was bleeding. He spoke, saying that she should stop using the dirty manner in which she used, as it was annoying to him. She acknowledged his words and said she would do anything His Highness wanted, making him glare at her and ask if she was doing it on purpose. On the first day of being possessed in a romance fantasy, she successfully survived. Little Calix was being held by two guards as he screamed to His Majesty, saying that his mother couldn't have committed treason and that the accusation was false. He begged His Majesty to save his mother. 
His Majesty gave him a deadly glare, questioning why he would save the person who tried to kill him. Little Calix's eyes widened in the realization that his mother wasn't going to be saved by His Majesty or anyone else. His knees were now on the ground as tears flowed freely, begging His Majesty but to no avail. He even went to his uncle and aunt, pleading with them to save his mother, insisting she had done nothing wrong. His uncle just bowed his head, saying there was nothing he could do about it, that neither he nor Little Calix could do anything. Little Calix tasted the bitterness of helplessness. Then the mantra came, I don't want you to die, I want you to live. If you don't want to die, you have to kill. And if you don't kill, you die. Back to present, Rose had just finished making the dessert she was preparing, smiling victoriously. She had made Janice delicious cookies with the new soft apple jam. Now she wanted to make a cup of fragrant tea as she asked Calix whether he wanted some. That's when Calix woke up from the dream in shock. He sat up on the bed, and that's when Royal entered the room. Royal looked at Calix and mentioned that he had knocked, but there was no answer. He thought Calix wasn't there. He was about to leave the bag he held and go, questioning whether Calix had been sleeping until now. Calix held his head and gritted his teeth as he replied that he really didn't know. Royal, confused, asked for clarification, prompting Calix to brush the conversation over and ask what had brought him there. Royal then informed Calix that the assassin had been taken care of, but regarding the third volume of the Imperial History, he showed it to Calix. Upon seeing that it was ripped in two, Calix smiled evilly. Meanwhile, Rose could feel a storm coming. She clasped her hands together, as if feeling cold and getting goosebumps. Finding herself in the kitchen, she faced the chef she had met the first time. The chef sarcastically expressed excitement about working with her, even emitting a forced laugh. Suddenly, he grabbed her shoulder, smiling widely and injecting more attitude into his greetings, commenting that she seemed diligent and that they would surely get along well. Rose acknowledged his words with a strange smile. He asked Rose why a maid like her kept coming to the kitchen. Rose wanted to faint as she looked at his hands and saw how dirty they were. How can you be a chef and have such dirty hands, she thought. She observed him, frizzy hair, unwashed hands, untidy and messy beard. His cleanliness level was zero. She wondered how he could look like that. Was it not upsetting to the stomach? Finally gathering her courage, Rose called the chef who answered. She smiled to hide what she was about to say and politely asked him to put his hair in a net, trim his nails, and tidy his beard, adding a please to be polite. However, he didn't see it that way at all. He exclaimed angrily, What? Rose impulsively shifted back as his reaction shocked her. The chef started screaming at her, questioning what she thought she was doing and telling him what to do. But Rose didn't move another inch. She made a mental note not to be scared because she was a brave employee who had worked in the service sector of Korea before. She had been through all of that countless times, so she knew just what to do. Changing her demeanor, Rose now acted oblivious as she reintroduced herself as Rose, the new maid. She continued pretending to consider the chef meticulously made. She questioned, The chef is meticulously made, isn't it? The chef looked at her in confusion. Rose then feigned fear, adding, but just in case, one in a billion, a tiny foreign object shows up in the food. The chef's expression also showed he was frightened too. Then she continued talking, feigning tears, telling him that His Highness would have no idea how truthful the chef is and he might throw away this wonderful food. But it's impossible for a great chef like you to make such a mistake, she ended. As she finished speaking, she looked at him expectantly, wondering whether it had worked or not. Seeing him not speaking, with his hands folded, she added that she was just saying it to prevent something like that from happening. The air had been tense, but a minute later the chef burst into a loud fit of laughter. He then said that he heard she did well in His Highness's bedroom and he thought it was just luck. Rose exclaimed, huh? The chef stretched his hand to collect the hat and said, well, whatever, as for the hat, nails and beard, I'll do what the lady said. He patted her back and complimented her, saying that she was a brave young lady and he liked that. She smiled and thanked him for his understanding, calling him Sir. He then questioned who Sir was, making Rose brush over her words immediately. He stretched his hands, attempting to shake hers as he introduced himself as Tyler, the head chef at the Crown Prince's Palace. He also told her that if she needed anything, she should let him know. Rose took his outstretched hands and pleaded that he should indeed take care of her in the future. 
So guys, this is where this part of the story ends. If you want the next part, please comment the name Rose. See you in the next one.